introducing our speaker, and to do that will be our esteemed chairman of the 1993 California... 1992. 1992, California State Health Thank you. 93 also. I'm not running this in 93. <laughs> Thank you for, for all being here this weekend. I hope you uh, had a lot of fun, and I hope you learned something besides. Uh, yesterday, Bob Walker opened by challenging, challenging us to make a difference. I hope we uh, take him up on that theme and follow through with some of the initiatives that, that the uh, Congressman and Barry Berenger uh, were talking about. Uh, Dan Graham pointed out that what we need is to show a payback to the American people for what this uh, the launch technologies can do for them. And speakers such as Edward Keith, Tom Schaefer, Joe Carroll are telling us what the, the, the launch industry needs is Henry Ford. Henry Ford hasn't been discovered in the launch industry. We just don't make enough of things. Um, now, in closing, I'd like to leave you with a vision of technologies which will be available in your lifetime which can reduce the launch cost by another order of magnitude. When I was putting this conference together, I contacted the Franklin Mead of the uh, Phillips Laboratory, the old Edwards Air Force Base Astronomics Laboratory, who funds all these crazy ideas. And I said, OK, who's, who's the best? Who's got the best of, of these ideas? And who's, got, who's going to be the best speaker to, to, to really give some people some exciting uh, uh, new technologies? Without hesitation, he uh, suggested that, that I get in touch with Lake Maribone. Uh, and besides, he's a professor of, of, of uh, Rent, my alma mater, uh, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Uh, Dr. Lake Maribone got his PhD here in San Diego in uh, engineering physics from the University of California in 1976. He worked in several companies investigating uh, uh, lasers and, and uh, propulsion technologies. Lake Maribos Light Craft Project is developing technology for an advanced band single stage orbit shuttle concept, the Mercury Light Craft. This class of laser boosted trans, trans atmospheric vehicles is envisioned for use in a hypersonic mass transit system able to transport its occupants to the furthest point on Earth in three quarters of an hour or to orbit in three minutes for the price of an airline ticket. So without further ado, I'd like to present Dr. Lake Maribel. Thank you, Glenn. This is the first time I've been invited to speak to the NSS group here, and uh, I have a special place in my heart for San Diego because I spent uh, seven years of my life here, including going to UCSD. So what uh, characterizes, I think, this conference here and the group of people assembled uh, compared to others I've uh, talked with in the past is the raw enthusiasm for doing something in space. I like this can-do attitude. Uh, it's desperately needed at this time, I think, in the uh, history of our evolution, of trying to create a spacefaring uh, civilization. I'm tempted to characterize myself uh, as a space systems architect and engineer with a very strong interest in advanced aerospace transportation systems as well as big space power. Um, as you see up here in the slide, I'm trying to envision the future and see what's out there. Um, but I'm looking at it in a slightly different way than most people do. I talk to a lot of groups, uh, not only within the government, the Air Force, SDI, uh, AIAA, uh, et cetera, but I also talk with the elementary school children. I talk with uh, grade school children, high school kids. Um, and I do an interesting test on them. I ask them, and they're right on, they're hearing what I'm saying, and they can imagine uh, the most complicated technology and what's required to make it uh, real. It's, it's amazing what they've got for imagination. But I asked them, said, how many people here are going to be riding on the shuttle to space? And all hands go up. All right? 
And I point out to them, well, that's going to cost you per pound of weight, let's say if you weigh 100 pounds, you're talking $4,000 to $8,000 a pound. Well, that's, that's what? Almost a half a million to a million dollars to get into space. And you see the faces drop. <laughs> Uh, but then I ask him, well, how many people watch these Saturday morning cartoons where uh, the characters there are jumping in their small spacecraft no bigger than a Volkswagen and fly off to space? How many people here in this room are going to be flying in those machines in space? All the hands go up. They're going to be here. They assume this technology is going to be here. And I tell them, I agree with you. I think it's going to be here. So I want to try to tell you how today. Right? So, next slide. We're talking about a technology that's beyond the NASP, beyond this air-breathing launch vehicle system, but may use a lot of spin-off technology in the hypersonics area and the material technology. But it's going to go significantly beyond that because the energetics of these vehicles are going to have to be quantum leaps and bounds beyond this machine. And I'll go on to explain why shortly. We call this uh, project uh, in the past the, the Lightcraft Project. In the far past, it was the Apollo Lightcraft Project because we were looking at a five-person spacecraft that was not much bigger than the Apollo uh, command module. Um, next slide. But uh, in trying to figure out some way of making this thing real, I'd look at it energetics that were well beyond what we have today with chemical propulsion systems. So uh, I run a design class at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. It's a senior level course. There's about 20 students there every semester. And I have them work on the Lightcraft project. And I run it like a small aerospace company. We have uh, eight different design teams. They're all focused on different portions of this technology. The engine, the airframe, the human factor side of it. Uh, but in getting there, we had to look at, way back in the start of this project, about seven years ago, we had to figure out, well, what do we have out there for energetic systems? Well, we've got fission, okay? Nuclear rockets have been uh, made. We even had a test run of a, uh, a ramjet, nuclear air-breathing ramjet. Well, there's a lot of uh, fissionable materials coming out of the back of that, both the air-breathing and the rocket systems. And besides, if you want to have a small, compact system with a human sitting next to it, and that's the focus of my efforts here, getting lots of people into space, you need a 100 metric ton biological shield and one meter of lead around this reactor. So, you know, we threw that one out. Then we looked at, uh, well, fusion. People are talking about fusion. Uh, in fact, we've got fast uh, neutrons from some of these experiments with big uh, energetic systems. Um, laboratory uh, experiments. Well, you have the same problem there. If we can get a fusion reactor running, a small, compact one, putting out lots of power, you still need this 100 metric ton biological shield around us, so we threw that out. <coughs> well, what's next? Well, we got antimatter. Antimatter's been uh, generated and stored in, in accelerators around the world for months at a time. Well, yeah, just a few particles of uh, antihydrogen, and I think antihydrogen ice has been made. But you combine that with, um, say, normal hydrogen, you've got all these energetic particles. All right, so you still need a biological shield. So we're, we're getting to systems that are just too big. What's left? Well, we've got high energy density materials. And this is something that Fred, Frank Mead at uh, the Astronautics Laboratory, now Phillips Laboratory, have been funding for a long time. Well, they're looking for these hyper energetic propellants that are maybe four or five times. Uh, more powerful than just burning hydrogen in free air, you know, to provide that mass by itself. But they're not stable for more than a fraction of a second before they go normal and blow. Well, I don't want that kind of propellant on board my spacecraft. So what do we got left? Well, we got wireless energy transmission. Well, this goes way back to Tesla and beyond. Uh, but how do we do it today? We've got the lasers, uh, they're growing in power. We've got the microwave power beamers, the millimeter wave power beamers, and those are growing much faster than the lasers. Those are pretty exciting. You know, we're up probably well beyond 10 megawatts in, in both areas now, and that's probably enough to hover a small one-person light craft. Climb up slowly above the clouds, but you're not gonna get to orbit on it. You need 
lots of power to get to orbit, and I'll explain how that uh, will work. So that's the energetic story. We need a we need a quantum leap in performance, uh, well beyond what we have today with chemical systems. Um, so anyway, looking at this approach here with directed energy, let's put the centralized power system in space and let's make it big. Let's make it designed to run a year without any downtime for maintenance. And our systems that do that today, it's electric power grid. Well, every morning I get up, plug my shaver, I expect that power to come into my shaver, you know, turn on. If it isn't, I'm, you know, what's wrong with the power station? My gosh, you know, can't we? get things running reliably here. I pick up the telephone lines. I use the telephone lines. I can call anywhere in the world. I expect those to work when I pick them up. If they're not working, I'm angry. Okay. Why isn't this thing working? Well, I depend on those kind of systems. I think you do too. But there are other things that I do. When I got mass transit, I take it. I take it in Washington, D.C. I take it up in the BART in Washington. Uh, I mean, up in San Francisco. I ride the trolley cars. Okay, These are mass transit systems. I, we need a hypersonic aerospace mass transit system. How do we do it? Well, we build a big power system, okay, that lasts for 30 years, and we have a power link directly to the spacecraft. All right? I always wanted my own. That's, that's my aspiration, some small little spacecraft. Well, to get the energetics in it, we need a power station that can power these vehicles. All right? And the converter can be very simple, and I'll go on to explain it, uh, how these converters can, can work. We need a road to space, all right? And wireless energy transmission can, can actually pull that off. Next slide. Okay, the Lightcraft project now started about seven years ago, uh, as far as being funded by uh, government uh, organizations, NASA, Air Force, SDI, and uh, produced a couple conceptual designs. These are case studies I want to run through here briefly before I get on to talk about the one-person Mercury light craft. The light craft technology demonstrator was a simple drone, one meter in diameter, and it was designed to uh, push a small payload, maybe 14 to 20 kilograms, into space with a ground-based laser. So we'll call this a pusher laser system because it pushes it up from the ground. The other concept here we looked at was man-rated systems, systems that are designed to carry extremely valuable payload to orbit or to any point on Earth with absolute reliability. Reliability that significantly exceeds, say, present-day airlines. All right? These are more complicated engines. The engine on the, the drone was simply a two-speed engine. It shifts gears at uh, Mach 3 and 100,000 feet into a rocket. Now, the air breathing is what was used to take off with. The uh, light craft is a more complicated engine. Well, it's got to produce static thrust on the ground to lift off like a helicopter and then climb above the clouds 30 or 40,000 feet, engage the high power laser beam and then accelerate the orbit. This is an incredibly compact vehicle designed around a combination of microwave and laser power. Microwaves only used for bad days when you got clouds you got to climb above them. Otherwise, you could use lasers the whole way. So it's a more complicated engine. I'll, I'll describe how these things work. This technology is right for picking up. What do we lack? We lack the power. We lack the power systems. Because the propulsion technology, the hypersonic technology, especially with the recent pushes into NASA, are very close at hand. OK, next slide. I'm going to speed up the slides here a little bit. Uh, this is a picture of the Lightcraft Technology Demonstrator. Probably some of you saw it on CNN News a couple summers ago when uh, uh, Mark Levinson of CNN Science News covered this project with RPI. It's a simple craft. Uh, it's, uh, this vehicle is thrown out of a compressed air cannon to about 100 meters per second uh, over here on the left-hand side of the page. When it's up about a football field uh, in the sky, a half second later, this uh, high energy laser on the ground here that was uh, going to be built out of white sands, a free electron laser, fires up, delivers power to the rear uh, parabolic uh, antenna mirror, and pushes this thing into orbit. Next slide. How does it work? Well, it's pretty simple. We've got this high reflectivity mirror, which is a, uh, put on the back side of kind of like a plug nozzle. You heard about those yesterday. And it just focuses the beam underneath this annular shroud. All right? 
And that annular shroud has got a gap in the front and it's fed with compressed air from the front. This is a, uh, the whole thing's a flying engine, the whole aft side is a nozzle and a collector, the whole front side is an inlet, and the annular shroud is mostly where the combustor is, if you can call it a combustor. It's where the energy is put in. Next one. So what happens at the focus underneath the shroud? Well, you focus the light beam some distance h above the surface, and depending upon what pulse duration, you know, how long the laser left on, pulse repetition frequency, focal intensity, you can generate about anything you want. In other words, you can program this engine uh, from start to orbit insertion with exactly the pulse strain you need. And this is no big problem for computers today, but you need a very flexible laser or microwave power beamer to accomplish it. What kind of intensities can you get at the focus here and pressures? Anything you want. You can get 10 atmospheres. You could get 10,000 atmospheres like we've gotten in some of our recent laser propulsion experiments. This is not a pipe dream. This is very well understood technology. It came out of SDI. Very well understood. So what you do is you generate a high pressure plasma bubble underneath the shroud. It expands on the shroud, pushes it in the direction of that thrust vector here. And then when the pressure behind that blast wave reduces to a low level, say one atmosphere local, that fresh air coming here to the inlet just blows it off the shroud and you're ready for the next pulse. You've got to get fresh, clean, low density air at the ignition site and you hit it again. This, there's no propellant in this thing other than some coolant that you might run to keep surfaces cool. But this optics technology, because of recent uh, advances at SDI, my favorite wavelength here for laser is one micron infrared, 99.99% reflectivity on these surfaces. Today, that's a, real, that's a real number, that's today, okay, with today's optics uh, and SDI technology. Next slide. This is a front picture of the uh, shroud and the shroud support struts, and uh, you can see the annular gap here where the air blows in underneath that engine. Very simple engine. When this thing converts to a rocket, that inlet slams shut, and you just feed onboard hydrogen or liquid air or liquid nitrogen into the focal regime of that laser and just continue on without an atmosphere. That's the rocket mode. Next slide. Now, We've actually done performance studies on this. One of my students did a PhD thesis on this engine, and we've ended up with performance uh, numbers here versus altitude and flight Mach number. And as you can see, uh, as you get up to higher and higher altitudes, the performance goes down, and our measure of performance here is newtons of thrust per megawatt of laser power, time average. Okay. So as you can see, this thing can fly up to 30 kilometers, which is about 100,000 feet and Mach 5 if you wanted to before you shut it off. That is just one example of a pulse detonation engine. You heard about the rumors of that from, from Aviation Week for chemical pulse propulsion systems. This is just happens to be laser detonated propulsion. And what's the specific impulse? For those of you, you know, in, into that uh, kind of thing, it's infinity. There's no propellant used on board. Well, that's a great, that gives you great mass ratios. <laughs> One, <laughs> while you're in the atmosphere, yeah, you can't, hard to beat the uh, specific impulse of infinity. Next slide. Well, what we actually looked at in the manned powered vehicles, and this, uh, the LTD, the Lightcraft Technology Demonstrator here is shown in comparison. We looked at one person, Mercury Lightcraft, a two person, Gemini, and a five person Apollo, which is just a Apollo back seat with a, Mercury, with a Gemini front seat. Uh, but most of our attention really is, is put onto the Mercury light craft uh, because it's small, and we're actually building a full-size uh, engineering prototype mock-up of this vehicle at RPI. Next slide. What's the mission features of this uh, this new hypersonic mass transit system idea? Well, I want to be able to get anywhere in the world in 45 minutes. You can do that at lower orbital speeds. Right? Access and egress times. Well, I'm going to go to local uh, San Diego International and take a light craft flight, you know, uh, anywhere in the world. Okay, I could also go to uh, Podunk Center International and uh, catch a flight anywhere. So what I'm trying to say is, you've got a clean landing pad. These things can set down anywhere, all right, and take off anywhere, as long as you've got a good uh, landing pad. Now. Um, the next part of this thing here is this is uh, really 
an environmentally uh, well thought out system. Uh, let's use space power system, okay? Sun, if you want a photovoltaic system, or I don't care what kind of energy conversion system you want to use, but let's put them in space. Let's put a lot of them out there. And let's, uh, let's use hydrogen for our energy conversion on board the vehicle. And because of the enormous specific impulses you can get with even fourth gear, which I'll talk about here later on, uh, five or 10% fuel fractions is all you need. We're not talking about any big external tank. This thing's single stage door. And finally, when they initially come out, it'll be like a rental car arrangement point to point. Uh, because the vehicles, even for a one person light craft, at today's uh, aerospace hardware rate, say for a fighter, might be at $250 a pound. We've got a light craft weighing 1,300 kilograms. You're talking about a million dollar machine. Well, you've got to keep those moving you know, to pay for themselves. And stuff. How do you do it? Well, okay, you got the space power system. I don't care if you put it on the moon or if you put it out in geostationary orbit, but you send uh, the power by way of a low altitude relay station. Uh, the light craft has got a robotic tripod landing gear. It's an intelligent machine, and you point this whole celestial uh, telescope or receiver at the laser power relay satellite, and when it comes over, you energize the system and you beam up. It's like they do in Star Trek, but you're riding in a small capsule. Okay. That's the basic system. And you just fly by that laser power relay and keep on going to space. Uh, this is a picture of a, a simple relay for a uh, laser system, um, the monocle. You could also do it for microwave systems. Depends on what you want to run this system on. And of course, you can probably skip the next slide. You've all seen an SPS since you're an L5 NSS. But basically, uh, I didn't hear about this lunar project of a power system on the, on the moon. But if, uh, if you look at a Peter, Peter Glazer system here of uh, 7 billion, no, 7 billion yeah, uh, watts electric for one power station. You need about a fleet of 500 of these things, all right, in geostationary orbit, and about 10,000 light craft, one, two, and five person. And you could take over right now one quarter of the international airline market. Now, who's going to fly a 12 to 14 hour flight to Tokyo when you can be there in 45 minutes for light craft for the same price? Well, I take the light craft. So here's an artist concept of our uh, Mercury light craft, and uh, artist got a little carried away, so it's got a lot of art in it. And <laughs> <laughs> doesn't really tell a lot of the concepts uh, very well, but notice that the laser power is coming from space. Okay, the takeoff mode here is to climb leisurely up to 30 or 40 thousand feet above where all the airliners are cruising around, and then begin the acceleration run to orbit. And we're talking three Gs, nothing too unusual, just like the space shuttle. But what we got here is the laser power comes on this four body on a, on a parabolic mirror collector. There are 24 addressable spots on this thing, and they're all computer controlled, and the laser power is delivered where it's needed at the time it's needed. All right? And that power goes into the engine. Now, those surfaces are used all the way to flight, but they have different functions. Everything on this spacecraft has got multiple functions on it. The form follows the function, just like the most architect systems or engineering systems. There's nothing new. You've got to look at, you've got light now. Everything's done with mirrors. You don't need tubing to, to, to carry your propellant, okay? You don't need these turbochargers per se. Um, you, know, you got you do with mirrors and lenses. Okay. Next slide. Well, one other thing I want to point out here before we go on to this is, in fourth gear, which is a critical engine mode, and it's turned on around Mach 10 or 11, you're halfway to orbit velocity, you have to take the laser power into some special lenses on the forebody here. Right here, there's a, there's a pointer. I don't like my phone. Yeah, there we go. You take the laser energy into these high power windows here into a rocket. So now we got a laser heated rocket. All right, we're feeding with hydrogen. Hydrogen is heated up to 20,000 Kelvin and about 440 atmospheres, right at the throat of the engine here. And you might think, it's really crazy, this thing's gonna burn up. Well, hydrogen radiates in the ultraviolet at those frequencies, and SDI has developed incredibly well reflecting materials at those wavelengths. This is bounce the radiation back into the gas. 
And that leaves you with a conduction and convection heat transfer process uh, problem at the walls, but we'll use film cooling to get that solved and transpiration cooling and whatever else is necessary. These problems can be solved. Then the hydrogen flows through an MHD generator, which is a turbine type device that pulls out half the enthalpy you put in, half the energy you put in initially as electric power. Each one of these devices, and they're about a meter long, is able to produce 100 megawatts electric. 100 megawatts. That's a lot of power. Okay? But it means the beam's got to come in at like 200 megawatts laser power or a little bit more. And about 20 centimeter diameter circle. But these, these are numbers that you know the designers of laser power systems are accustomed to. I'm not talking about anything unusual here. This is an SDI type number. And then this hydrogen, as it comes out the back end here, just dumped overboard. It's cooled off to 10,000 degrees Kelvin. We dump it overboard. It burns up in the atmosphere and produces a little water vapor. So what? Okay. Well, this three to 400 megawatts electric uh, on board the vehicle, then, is used to accelerate the conducting air slipstream. All right, you've all seen meteorites come in and all the air blows around it. Okay, you just enhance the electrical conductivity of that, and you accelerate the air around the vehicle like it's the armature of an electric motor. And the kinds of performance efficiencies that you can get out of that engine is eight to 20,000 seconds specific impulse. That allows you to get these incredibly small mass fractions. Next one. Now, the power densities of this machine are very different than what we're accustomed to looking at. Here's the NAS, it takes off 150,000 pounds. Mercury's at 3,000 3, pounds. Horsepower is the same, 440,000 horsepower. And here we've just got three of those MHD generators running. What's the horsepower to pound ratio? 100 to 150 horsepower per pound of spacecraft weight. That's what you see. That's how hard the space shuttle main engine high pressure fuel turbo pumps are running. 100 horsepower per pound. And this thing is wrapped around you. You're inside of it. Okay, next slide. But I want to point out that the energetics of the system are not, are not well beyond our capability of handling them and harnessing these kinds of energetics. I talked about the fuel fraction 5 to 10 percent because the specific impulse of this engine is so phenomenal. And we're, we're setting up at RPI right now to do a full scale engine segment test in uh, our RPI's hypersonic wind tunnel. We have a high energy laser there. What's the propellant energy density? Well, say 400 kilojoules per uh, gram. Well, what does that mean? Well, when you heat the hydrogen in this engine, the converter, up to 20,000 Kelvin, that's kind of energy you have to pack into that hydrogen. Well, if you took hydrogen and just burned it in the atmosphere, and you assumed the oxygen was free, like the NASP does, what's released? 120 kilojoules per gram. All right, that's just hydrogen by itself. So we're talking about something that's about four times more energetic than hydrogen. And that's, what the Air, that's why the Air Force is trying to get these high energy density propellants together, HEDM. Because that's, that's about their level of the goal. We can do that right now with a laser. So why look any further? You know? Maybe we can do this. Next slide. The mass flow rate through this engine is like a kilogram or two per second. That's not much of a mass flow. Here's a performance projection of the engine that I told you about uh, specific fuel specific impulse. Uh, right here, and at 100,000 feet, when you turn this engine on, you can get 20,000 second specific impulse. And as the altitude goes up here, your performance flattens out. And at 230,000 feet, when you're at orbital velocity or lunar insert speed velocity, you could be Mach 30 or 35 and go right into a lunar orbit trajectory. You're at 6,000 seconds. That's still pretty good. The space shuttle main engine is a factor of 10 smaller than that. Okay, next slide. Now this, this slide has got a lot of uh, words on it. <laughs> uh, but I want to point out that uh, what, what we've designed here in this class is a 
and that's the design effort. We also have a technology push that's run by other government organizations. A highly compact vehicle. Why? We don't lift, we don't lift any more weight than we need to. And with this MHD engine, you don't need a sharp point on this thing to get a good inlet efficiency because you're physically grabbing onto the air and throwing it out the back. You're not dumping raw power into this compressed air and expecting the air to expand or not, like the scramjets are today. And this does have a scramjet mode in third gear. You physically grab a hold of it and you throw it out the back and say, you're going and we're going to get thrust from you. But that momentum exchange process is done with free air. Also, other things, we're going to cover the whole floor body here with like shuttle tile material that's super reflecting and a heat insulator, so there's no uh, cooling required up there. We have to cool the mirrors here at the center body, max and diameter. We have to cool the struts out of the shroud, and we have to cool the shroud. But that's it. The whole back side is a carbon-carbon uh, uh, heat shield. And that's uncooled also. Next slide. Now, I, I mentioned before this is a five-speed system, and basically, this is a very complicated slide, I know, but the key point here is coupling coefficient, newtons per megawatt, all right? How much thrust you can get per megawatt of power? And this is something every air-breathing propulsion engineer is plagued with. As you go faster, you find out, say, with uh, turbojets and turbofans, why am I carrying this heavy compressor and turbine along? It's not doing me a damn bit of good. I wish I could get rid of it and just have a combustor in the center with an open hole in the front and the back or an inlet and exhaust. Well, that's the ramjet. And as you see, the ramjet is able to get out a little further here in flight Mach numbers, say to Mach 5, 6, 7. But then you find out the only way to go any further is by supersonic type um, inlet speeds through your combustor. So you've got to go to scramjet mode. Ultimately, like I said, we're converting to an MHD fanjet mode from uh, Mach 11, 12. So you have to assume you're going to have to shift gears into different engine modes on the way to orbit. Next slide. I don't mean to get so technical here, but I want to try to give you some flavor for the background of this machine. And yeah, you could design a completely different machine that was flying only on microwave power, or millimeter power, and it might have to be a bigger antenna and the spacecraft might even be neutrally buoyant or partially buoyant at sea level. Might be a completely different system, but you can design these things. You can do numbers on them. We know how to design these systems. One thing the lifecraft does need is it needs to take advantage of the adaptive optic systems that SDI has produced. You have to be able to bend and distort that uh, mirrored surface on the lifecraft receiver on the core body. Why? Because there's this shock wave that you've got over the whole floor body of the vehicle. You've got a compressed air wedge. The index of refraction is different than there. And when the laser beam bounces off that surface, it comes with a different focus because of that compressed air. And as you're flying up as a function of Mach number, you've got different densities back there. The shock wave is in a different position, so you have to actively counteract for it. It's not a big problem because you just put pressure sensors on the whole floor body, sense the pressure, and update the optic pre-program it. And you can actively check how, it, how am I doing now. Okay, so you can put that uh, beam on a focus here for a, a secondary uh, optic surface or just a focus for a shroud lifter kind of an engine. Uh, you know, however you want. Next slide. Now, I'll show you this isn't a pipe dream. Uh, the uh, Air Force and SDI got together and cut some uh, high power laser optics for us for uh, CO2 laser experiments at RPI. Now, I'm looking into this optic here. This is a full-size section of a Mercury Lightcraft optic. It's 1 24th of the whole annulus. And that's the way you'd make these things. You'd make one high-quality surface and you'd replicate it. You'd mass produce them. I've got to think Henry Ford type uh, method here. These spacecraft are axisymmetric. You can tool them up on a lathe. You can trim up the surfaces, you know. So anyway, this mirror was cut on the biggest diamond lathe in the world at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, and the outer radius here is 43 inches. That's a pretty large optic, but uh, across the flat here, it's, uh, it's about 17 and a half inches long, basically. And this has got a good enough reflectivity for our laser propulsion experiments, and it gives a line focus off-axis on the parabola. Next slide. Uh, two of them were cut for us on this big lathe that's shown in this picture here. That's upside down. No, right, right to left, sorry. 
Uh, this is the lathe here. It's all in an oil bath and uh, shower, I mean. And the temperature of that oil is controlled at plus or minus 0 0.001 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, and you see the two mirror optics here and here. Okay, and they're cut out of aluminum, 6061 T6 aluminum. This is just a, a rod here, I mean a, a beam, steel beam, to uh, try to keep those surfaces uh, you know, in the right place. And a single crystal diamond comes there and cuts the surface in eight hours. That's all it takes to cut it. Okay, but that's, that's your master. Now these things could be polished to a much higher degree of accuracy than this slate is able to do right now with other techniques, but once you've got the blanks. Uh, unfortunately, the, the air conditioning people decided to do maintenance the day they were cutting this, and the room temperature was going up a degree and down a degree, and uh, you could see those waves on the mirror surface when you looked at them. It's that sensitive. Uh, and then a day later than that, they shut off the air conditioners altogether to do maintenance, and the, the diamond crystal, a single crystal, gouged into the mirror, lifted off the surface, and they had to cut the whole thing all over again. So, I mean, these are the kind of things you're running in the technology program. Next slide. But we got them now, and uh, we do have a high power laser at RPI loaned to us from uh, Naval Research Laboratory. This is a picture of the liftoff engine mode. It's just a concept slide. But basically, the laser beam comes down here, hits the primary optics, hits the secondary optics, and focuses somewhere in the vehicle base. Here it's shown at the bottom. It could just as well be in the center. And then um, that would basically create a high pressure uh, blast wave that's sent off the vehicle base, pushing it up, and then you'd step the laser focus over a little bit. And now what are you doing? Well, you're driving compressed air into the adjacent next detonation site. It's like having a turbocharger on your car. You can compress the air into the next site. So you drive a rotary detonation wave around the bottom of this engine. And what frequency do you operate at? Well, what do you want it to operate at? You, know? you want to pulse it all at subsonic uh, I mean, uh, sub-audible frequencies below 20 hertz so people can hear it? Or do you want to pulse it at uh, 20,000 hertz beyond the frequencies that most people can hear? You could do either if you wanted to. It might drive your dog nuts, but <laughs> you wouldn't be able to hear it. Uh, it's also dangerous sound pressure levels, but you, uh, you wouldn't be able to hear it. Next slide. So we call this the rotary-driven detonation wave engine, and this concept shows it. Uh, basically, you've got a series of detonation sites that you program on the vehicle base, which is just nothing but a um, uh, reentry heat shield, and uh, dry this oblique shock around the bottom part of the vehicle. And that's the way you lift off and hover on this machine with laser power. Next slide. Okay, now I want to talk to you about proof of concept experiments that are underway or have been done in the past. This is not a pipe dream. Uh, components of this technology are well under hand, mostly driven by earlier SDI efforts. Next slide. Uh, we were invited to come down to the Naval Research Laboratory and use their Pharos 3 1 micron laser. This shows you a picture here of the target facility right here. We put our experiment right in this spherical uh, stainless steel uh, chamber. And these are final focusing lenses here, three of them. And then there's a, a spherical uh, lens right here that puts the power wherever we want it inside the chamber. Next slide. Okay, what we have is a ballistic pendulum. Uh, these are like the experiments that Goddard did with pulse propulsion, rockets, that we're using here. We've got a hinge point right here. We've got a one foot diameter plexiglass plate with a little steel witness plate in the center. We're bringing the laser in here from right to left, focusing right here. We want to create a detonation, send this blast wave off like a mini A bomb type thing, and push down on the plate, and then measure how fast it moves. All right, we can figure out exactly what impulse we've got. Next slide. This is a top view of that showing us uh, radial symmetry here. We had two different inserts. One of them was a uh, plain cold roll steel. And we had another one that was a special magnet, uh, half a Tesla. And these aren't the normal uh, magnets we played with as kids. This will stop your digital watch when it's a foot away from it. Jam it up. OK, this is a powerful magnet. Next slide. I want to know what the magnetic field did. Okay, so here's a picture of the air breakdown here that's created just above the plate, and then some power splashed through and hit the backside of this plexiglass, throwing off a little bit of a glow there and evaporating a bit of the plexiglass. So what we do is we just measure the impulse. This was a, a low energy level, like 20, 40, uh, 20 to 40 joules. Next slide. 
This one is uh, about 180 joules uh, with the magnet in it. The other one didn't have the magnet in it. And see, it's a very different display. You can imagine the field lines coming out here perpendicular to the magnet. Double the impulse just by putting that half of the Tesla field in there. Next slide. Here's some surprises that you get. You know, when you do experiments. So this gives you the uh, data here in coupling coefficient uh, with the magnet, without the magnet. Now, this laser is designed for fusion experiments. It's not a laser propulsion engine, uh, per se. Uh, the pulse duration is 3 to 10 nanoseconds. Very short pulse. And we would have liked something like 30 nanoseconds to, say, a microsecond for, for a better uh, match with this engine cycle. So there's no guarantee the magnet will give us any advantage at the, uh, the longer pulse duration, but maybe it would. We don't know. You have to do the experiment. But even at this level here, what is heading toward at the higher pulse energies, and the highest one here is 185 joules uh, on that laser pulse, and we on previous tests got up to something like 370 joules. It's heading at about 200 newtons per megawatt. What does that mean? What's like the earliest after burning turbo jets? This thing works. It's like a little turbo jet. It's a bad turbo jet, you know, but it's a turbo jet. This thing can go like a bat, all right? We outperform a uh, turbo jet, depending on what pulse duration you use, and if you're not concerned about that much about the power you're spending. We think that you could turn this number up to be at least four to five times this level for a properly designed engine, and that's about Harrier performance. You want to get Harrier performance? You've got to be able to do that, or a little better with this kind of engine. Next slide. So that's the plot of that, and you can see it is heading up. You know, with pulse energy here up to about 200 or beyond for this experiment. Next slide. Uh, this gives you a picture of the uh, laser breakdown on a metal plate instrumented with uh, pressure transducers. You can see the holes here. This is the laser breakdown area. This is the uh, laser power that splashed or that propagated through the focus. Uh, hitting the plate. This is cold roll steel. So we also did other experiments that measured the pressure. Next slide. This is a picture of the uh, gigawatt laser that the NRL has loaned to us at RPI. We haven't resurrected it yet, but two modules of, of the four were running at AFCO Weber Research Laboratory a couple of years ago. This puts out one kilojoule of uh, CO2 laser energy, more than enough for any experiment for a full-size engine segment for a light crap. Now, getting the rep rate that you need is another problem. But we have the devices today, both microwave, millimeter wave, and lasers, to do full-size engine segment tests. We got them. This thing is 30 feet long and uh, weighs about 4,000 pounds per module, and there's four of them. So it's a pretty hefty device. It is a laboratory device. It's not an industrial piece of equipment that churns out a gigawatt of power. It doesn't do that. It gives you one pulse, or two pulses if you do it right. What we have at RPI is, uh, this is the laser now set up at RPI. We're going to have two laser modules firing into a test tank here, and we have two going into another uh, test area for liftoff engines. But what we're setting up for here, this is a hypersonic uh, shock tunnel. Air comes down here, hypersonic velocities, uh, and there's a nozzle in here, and we can put a test machine inside this evacuated dump tank. We get test times about a millisecond to uh, five milliseconds, which doesn't sound like a lot of time, but at hypersonic velocities, you know, if you're going Mach 25, that's eight kilometers per second, okay? You can do the math on it. You've gone a long ways, you know, at a millisecond or two. Next one. And this is just a, uh, a slide showing the uh, driven tube, the nozzle, and where we put our test section here um, for, our, for our tests. Our model would put it there. This is a picture of the model uh, that we made for the light craft. This is a six inch diameter hypersonic inlet. And it's made out of brass. You see it's got little holes in it. We've got pressure transducers um, all over the inside of this thing. And uh, you see the shroud here. Um, and this is just supported from the back side. We wanted a clean surface here to do tests uh, with. Next slide. This is going. Yeah, you want to lay it down for all the way. Um, this shows the location of the pressure transducers on the four body. Next slide. And also, uh, the next slide shows it on the uh, on the shroud. Trying to give you some idea how you can get data 
All right, and the next slide uh, tells you uh, a little bit about the uh, hypersonic facility. We have a 24 inch diameter test section. Mach numbers from 8 to 25. Well, we're trying to get to orbit, right? Mach 25. Uh, test times 1 to 5 milliseconds. We get stagnation temperatures uh, 800 to 4100 Kelvin. Now, what does that mean? Well, if you took a NASC to orbit and you're at 100,000 feet in Mach 10, the stagnation temperature is exactly this, 4100 Kelvin. We're not fudging anything on this. At Mach 10 or 11 in this tunnel, you've got the real flight condition. Next slide. This is a picture of a of the uh, light craft with Schlern photography. You can see that shock wave right here. The bow shock going into the inlet. Now here we've got the inlet retracted. Uh, our research has shown us that the best way of flying this light craft to orbit is with a shroud completely retracted. So we use using external MHD in the area of the shroud. And that's what we've finally decided to do and talked to Paul Sist and a bunch of other people in the NASA program and they said retract this route, you cut your drag enormously, and you'll probably eliminate all the weight drag half of your engine because that bow shock will disappear. So you won't hear it on the ground. Okay? No shock beyond the vehicle. Next slide. Here's a picture, turn that side if you want, but uh, of the light craft uh, during a high temperature test you can see the glowing uh, air on the forebody here. That's, that's what they look like in the tunnel when they're tested. The next slide shows another little bit clearer photograph of it. Um, and you can see the shroud here is in the open position, and that would be translated back at Mach 10. Next slide. Now I'd like to tell you a little bit uh, about some more fun we're having with the uh, engineering design class, which is a senior level and junior level type uh, course. We have 20 students every semester. And what we're doing is prototyping this whole light craft concept. Next slide. We've got the vehicle geometry uh, generated on our computers, and we've got it mathematically um, all figured out as to what every single you know, square inch of surface is supposed to look like, or form follows function. Next slide. This is an aft view of it, and this is uh, shown with the shroud in the forward position. Next slide. This is the uh, hatch. We've got it about 24 inches wide, so we basically uh, got to get into this machine, much like Mercury or Gemini, through a hatch. Okay. Primary mirrors are below it, and the shroud, as you see, is right here. Next slide. This is a picture of the vehicle with the door down. Now. The way you get into this machine is you touch a proximity switch or garage door type opener and the spacecraft would kneel towards you, the door would come down and you'd walk in. Next slide. So students are designing um, actuator systems for the door. You can get in this thing. This would be a pressure bulkhead doors, obviously, just like the airlines or, or the mercury capsule. Next slide. Uh, students have also figured out the geometry for the chair inside. Uh, it could be configurable, like a dentist chair. It could even help you out through the door uh, if you wanted to. Uh, the uh, it could be a projection television screen here for uh, you know space viewing or whatever. You see this movable screen comes down. You could have engine instruments down here, uh, flat screen displays. And we found that the, the American industry uh, here in the government, or in, in the United States has been really helpful at uh, sending the students free of charge, whoever they mostly pick. You know? And uh, that makes this affordable. You know, we can build these things for very little money, things like for a proof of concept. This thing doesn't have to fly. Uh, this is a view of the uh, underside of the vehicle, showing the tripod landing gear. And this is the foot pads right here, here, and here. These are openings here for the MHD generator exhausts on the bottom. Next slide. Upside down. So that shows you a uh, picture of the landing gear that they designed uh, retracted. You can see here this is the hip joint, that's the knee joint, uh, this is the foot joint down here, and there are two actuators, one inside and one on top. We picked electromechanical actuators rather than pneumatic or hydraulic because they're a little safer. Next slide. They're not as strong, but um, you know, they work. And so this is extended. This is one of the actuators extending the lower leg here. And we're trying to figure out what do we use for the foot. Well, we wanted about a foot, one foot diameter, so that if we sat down um, you know, and, and land that wasn't as sturdy, uh, emergency landing or whatever, would you know, drive a leg in and tip over. 
um, and found out that the cheapest way of getting these one foot diameter dishes of the right contour was to go to buy a couple Chinese woks. So, <laughs> two steel woks glued together for the foot. So it seemed proper somehow. <laughs> the rest of us made out of 6061 T6. Okay, now we're doing some preliminary design of the four body here and stress analysis. This is the door opening. These are stringer structures here. We have bulkheads around here, up in here. Next slide. And the students are designing actuation systems for the shroud. And we were initially looking at rear shroud supports, as indicated here. And uh, we also looked at front supports like the uh, Lightcraft Technology Demonstrator. Basically, we have a series of 24 actuators that uh, screw the uh, shroud forward and back. Next slide. Using something like this, you know, a screw worm type actuator all linked together. Very positive. Each of these things has about 1,000 uh, pounds of uh, lift force which would be enough to control the light craft in about a 10G acceleration lifting on the shroud. Next slide. Uh, top view of the same system. Next slide. I'm busy here. That's a picture of the, the old uh, shroud support strut that we were using until we um, decided to challenge the students with where do you put the superconductors for the, uh, the external magnetic field on the MHD engine. And it turned out the best location was here and there. And if you put it here and you try to translate this round forward, you cut the superconductor in half, <laughs> which isn't good. So we went to a forward strut system in later design. Next slide, which is shown right here. Um, this is the external strut, uh, and the MHD accelerator channel will be between these two electrodes, which are placed placed on the inside uh, portions of the shroud. But uh, 10 inches gap at the entrance and about 12 inches gap at the exit. And uh, we have uh, Dick Rosa at uh, Montana State University who, whose MHD fan jet uh, was his, his brainchild actually way back when. But he was driving with an open cycle nuclear gas core reactor. <laughs> <laughs> and that didn't seem to make much sense to me. So uh, we've collaborated here. Next slide. So we're doing uh, stress analysis. Um, this is a pulse dancer. You're going to have that shroud dancing around. It's going to go into a lot of different funny modes. You want to make sure it doesn't rip off and self-destruct. Next slide. Okay, here's the MHD uh, uh, laser energy converter. Uh, laser beam comes through this high power window at the Brewster angle. Those of you who have studied high power laser optics, falls on a mirror, comes with a focus here, runs through this uh, MHD generator channel. I had a PhD student design that for his whole, his whole four-year program. Next slide. And that's the energy converter, 100 megawatts electric per device. And here's one, a three generator design that the students came up with. We also looked at four generator designs, and this next slide shows um, the difference between the four and the three. And we decided, well, if the person climbs in through this hatch here and dodges between two MHD generators with superconducting magnets on the sides, and it's five Tesla at the entrance, two <laughs> Tesla at the exit, um, his head you know, is right below one of these superconducting uh, magnets. And it seems to be at, like a place that I want my head. <laughs> so we decided, okay, we'll put the head here between two MHD generators, go the four root, and now we got one spare. So if one you know, gets damaged on the way to orbit, you can still get there. All right? Now then you wonder about the field. Well, we have a two Tesla field as our point design around the outside, but in the geometry of it, the field at the center body, the belly button, whatever, is near zero because two dipoles are uh, facing each other. So we'll set up the dipoles on the MHD generator so they counteract the field from the accelerator in the head and the feet. Okay, so that's the point design here. So the fields will be below areas where they're, they're dangerous. Now, if you go into a hospital, you get a you get a scan, you know, with a NMRI machine, nuclear magnetic resonance imaging machine. You're in one Tesla. Okay, and you sign a release form when you get inside, okay? You spend 45 minutes there, and they say, you're fine, you know? or you're not so fine. Um, but anyway, the point is, one or two Tesla is what they use, okay? In, in that kind of a machine. So we're designing for something that, you know, people are accustomed to being inside. You'll still probably have to sign the release. But uh, there doesn't seem to be any long-term uh, damages to those kinds of fields, and we can reduce it much further than that for the length of this 45-minute flight. Okay, next slide. 
All right, we've uh, done uh, conceptual designs here on the superconducting magnets for the MHD generator power system, and this one will generate at the center here about 5.5 Tesla required at the entrance to the MHD generator. Next slide. I want to tell you a little bit how this uh, MHD fan jet works. It's pretty simple. For those of you who are propulsion uh, engineers or study the NASP ideas, there's nothing more than an air turbo rocket. What's an air turbo rocket? Well, for our engine here, you take a laser beam, you put it into uh, focus here at the entrance to an MHD generator, and you heat up hydrogen. This is a laser heated rocket, gas generator and you expand that down an MHD generator okay, and you pull out half the power that you put in as laser energy as electric power. Take the electric power and use it to accelerate the heated air behind the shock wave. Well, until you get to Mach 10 or 11 or 12, you know, the air is hardly heated at all. But at those velocities, it's starting to glow. You know, hey, we're glowing. So we're starting to get some ionization and dissociation. What we'd like to have great, you know, conductivity at that point. We don't have it, but um, using the primary optics I talked about earlier, out here in the edge of the vehicle, if you retract this route, you get a focused laser power um, detonation, why not ventilation? You can heat the air pulsed at any point you want around the entrance of this MHD accelerator, drive the electric power through it and accelerate it back. Next slide. So that's the basic idea. You take this conducting plasma and accelerate uh, it out the back. Now, our original design looked at an internal MHD accelerator, and Paul Sis said you're crazy. Uh, it's going to burn up um, and too much drag. So, we tried this route and already covered that. Next slide. We're almost wrapped up here. So, this is kind of a messy slide, but now we're retracting this route. The normal field is out here through the accelerator. You accelerate the air around this shroud, and that's the MHD fan jet engine. And this is what the, the uh, converter, energy converter, looks like. Uh, so the next to last slide that shows you the uh, mock-up uh, that we've got. <laughs> yeah, this is the one-quarter aero shell of the full-size Mercury light craft. Uh, it's, a little, it's very smooth. All it doesn't look like it. we haven't painted it. And that's the female mold here that we're pulling out our aerial shells uh, with. So we're going to do a full-size um, engineering prototype mock-up. Okay, this is the last slide. <laughs> this project is successful. <laughs> uh, sometime in the future. Smiling Jacks will have to get rid of all of his conventional aircraft and go into spacecraft that are linked to this uh, mobile space power grid. Thank you very much. A couple of questions. That yes. Operating, operating in just a, a rocket mode where you squirt a you know liquid or gas out, such, such as steam or whatever, and then laser detonation. What sort of ISPs do you, can you get? Uh, an area of thousand to two thousand seconds. Factor of ten less than the fan jet. Um, it would seem to me, for example, uh, that having a tank full of water that's half the volume of the spacecraft, you can do away with everything else, you'd have a lousy mass ratio be two and a half or three to one, but with a thousand seconds, two and a half to one mass ratio gets the rest of the orbit. And since hydrogen, you know, for 10,000 seconds, hydrogen tank is going to be bulkier than a water tank at 1,000 seconds, why not forget four of the modes and just go with the water tank of water? A couple of reasons. Um, you can climb up to 100,000 feet without using any mass at all, using a laser heated air. Let me finish though. Um, and if you do that with water vapor, um, I got a situation worse than the airliners today. I live out in Vermont, uh, just uh, about a half hour from RPI. Well, let me, let me consider it. And I look up in the, in the morning sky that's completely clear. And within about a half hour to an hour, there's so many airliners crossing up there, dumping in water vapor. Uh, at 30 and 40,000 feet, it gets cloudy. Now imagine, you got a fleet of 10,000 light craft, or maybe even 40,000 if you want to replace all the airliners, depositing water vapor to the extent you're talking about. It would have, I think, enormous environmental implications. Uh -huh. But you know, that's just an You know, I, I think it'd be worth looking at. 
I like the specific impulse of infinity a little better. <laughs> my opinion, yes. I'm just curious. You're depending on the the power grid and the lasers being yeah. in space, correct? Yeah, for the long term, it makes sense because if you're using solar energy in space, um, you can beam it around the planet, and you're not having to worry about terrestrial resources that uh, might be tied to hydrocarbon. Are you considering a chassis uh, ground-based improved that actually pump it up from the That would be a wonderful thing to try. And you could probably do the early experiments with pulse microwave or millimeter wave at much lower power density. Do you have a question? Yes. What if, oh, yeah. Uh, um, since the um, this last question, then we'll move outside. Have questions? Okay, yeah, we have to the, talk to you outside. Okay, um, one more question. Since the MHD uh, generator is uh, actually hooked up to the, electrically to the uh, to the outer rim, yeah. um, is it possible to design it so that so that you have entry points? For the MHD generator, both in the, in the top and the bottom, so the laser can be in any geometry relative to the spacecraft. Oh yeah, you could design a completely different light craft. This is just one example. Can we conduct the rest of it outside? So they can thank you very much. <laughs> On behalf of the California Space Development Council and San Diego L5, thanks for being here. Yeah.